So let me give you a couple of idea where I went in India. First of all, if you haven't been to India, India is a subcontinent, you know, in Asia here, China's up here, and Nepal is over here, and India is down here. To the east, you have Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, and then even to the southeast, you have Australia down here. But that's where India is. Uh, Bombay or Mumbai is on. This is sort of where um, Hollywood or Kali or Bollywood is up here. Uh, Delhi is the capital of India. And then uh, India has about 20 some odd states. South India is where my family's from. And you can see South India, this is called the state of Tamil Nadu, where people speak Tamil. Nadu means land, Tamil Nadu, the land of Tamil. Uh, over here is Kerala, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka. These are states. So think about like if you're in the United States, Massachusetts, Georgia, California. So this is Tamil Nadu. By the way, here's Chennai, which is sort of the capital of Tamil Nadu. Uh, Pondicherry is south of Chennai, and everyone speaks French there. One of the things uh, we need to understand is that when the British, uh, when people came to India during colonialism, different European groups came to India, right? The British came to India, the Dutch came to India, the Portuguese came to India, the French came to India, and they all occupied different parts of India. So, for example, the Portuguese occupied a place up here called Goa. People speak Portuguese, and they also speak an Indian language. Uh, Tamil Nadu in Chennai was really occupied by the British. Pondicherry here was occupied by the French, which is still part of Tamil Nadu. My family, or my ancestors from this land called Muawur, they've called it sometimes people call it Mugawur, and it's south of Madurai, which is south of Chennai. So we drove all the way down here, and I'm going to show you some shots of that. So this is essentially driving into my village. Let me share with you this. And this is what the land looks like. This is, you know, all green. And by the way, it's the middle of summer. So it's even much more uh, greener in other occasions. So then we come to the city of Mohur. Muham in Tamil means face. And Ur, if, even if you look in the Bible, the word Ur means land. You know, Abraham came from the Ur of Chaldea, right? Mohur is our town. And as you, you see a sign nowadays, they have modern signs, very different than when I grew up there. And this is a shot as you go into the village. So this is what you'll see. This is a, you know, an Indian village. You can see it's dirt. I mean, we had dirt roads when I grew up. They put some cement down. You'll see dogs. You'll see people with motorcycles, little kids going to school. You know, it's not like, you know, beautiful paved roads. It's sort of a mishmash a little bit. But this is, we're going taking a right here. And we're going to be pulling up to... Uh, where my grandparents' home is. Obviously, they passed on, but I'll, I'll show you that as we come over there. And this is the home um, that as a child, so this is, and by the way, you'll see temple monuments. People in villages always have little temples. That's the temple right there. So that's us in our car driving in. And that's my grandparents' home, which will be coming up shortly. But, you know, it gives you an idea if you haven't been to India, right? You know, this is sort of the village structure, you can see how narrow the roads are. Um, and this is a car going down there. And it's sort of incredible how the drivers actually drive on these roads and they're able to actually navigate to these very, very small roads. But anyway, I'm, just, I'm sort of gonna move forward, but you can see upcoming is a bunch of people waiting there. They knew that I was coming and they had literally created a little ceremony for me. Um, these are people would come there and all these women had gotten dressed up in these very beautiful saris uh, waiting for my arrival. That's the little temple and there's this guy here and, and they all were waiting here. When I arrived there, th these women were there. I mean, there's different kinds of saris. These are called putta saris, saris that you get decked out with when you're, it's important, but you can see all these people are excited I was here. And then in India, when you go, when they honor you, they typically have a piece of cloth. They put it over you. What we also noticed is people had taken out huge billboard ads. There must have been 10 or 15 of these. And I was quite sort of humbled by this all over the village. And this is no small feat for people to spend their money to do this. So they had said, you know, the inventor of email, Dr. Shiva Iadura, there's a picture of me with the president of India, Abdul Kalam. That's me when I visit. And this is the prime minister of India, Modi. So they had sort of put all this together in days. And uh, and here's another one at the school that I was gonna speak at with these kids, young kids, you notice some of them have bare feet. 
Uh, some of them have shoes, some of them don't. And they'd also done this other one here, you know, the inventor of email. Um, so after this, we went to the actual school. By the way, in India, what's interesting is villages are controlled, uh, run by local governance. And it's typically women. A lot of women run these local villages. So you don't really have to talk about, quote unquote, feminism in India because women run a lot of these villages. They had organized this event for me to speak at, at the local school. And there's about 1,500 kids. Many years ago, many of these kids, they didn't have this schoolhouse. They were literally outside. It's about 10 or 15 years ago. They would sit under a mango tree. And my family and I had helped to build a bunch of buildings. So they actually had buildings and we built a little computer center uh, for these kids. So these, when I arrived, these were the kids there. And you can see all the kids were pretty excited. So they have the, the girls here in their uniforms and the guys are in the back. So they separate the guys and the girls. So there was some press there, et cetera. Then I was given various gifts. This, this little young man had actually taken one of my pictures and he'd actually drawn it. At the end of the day, what was interesting was this became sort of a, a news story. You know, in India, people uh, have different languages. The language here is called Tamil, T-A-M-I-L. And the biggest news station, which reaches around 60 million people, had done a news story. Now, I'll so you won't be able to understand the language, but it was a pretty big news story because what I did was I made the announcement that many of these kids, when I was did the event, were very excited to ask me what should they do in their careers, um, how could they better themselves. Education is a central part in all Indian families. And what I said was I'd come back to actually give everyone the Foundations of Systems course because I felt that what happens in education, everything's siloed. You study biology, study computer science, you study engineering. But what about learning something even more foundational, the foundations of systems? So I made a big announcement that I offered this course. And I also talked about uh, my effort with Cytosoft to integrate Eastern and Western medicine. So this came out in a big way and it reached around 60 million people in the local, um, well, throughout India. So let me play this for you. But you can see this is your local Indian news. And I'm not sure if you can hear this, but this is Indian. Uh, it was an exclusive story. You can see it's in the Tamil language. We honored one of the great leaders of India, a guy called Kamraj. That's Michelle. Everyone loved Michelle there. Um, you can see all the kids uh, really loving this. Um, and, and then they had a huge stage set up. Um, and the kids are, again, very excited. Um, various people introduced me, talked about the various, my his, history. It was a, a big news story, um, and the announcer is really announcing that Dr. Shiva has come back to his village to talk about the need to integrate Eastern and Western medicine and the need for a systems approach to understanding life, and that I was essentially offering a, uh, the Foundation Systems course for free to all the kids, and we made it accessible. So this was a pretty big news story um, across India. And so for me, I shared with you that I want to offer this course to everyone, but I thought it would be most appropriate to launch it back in the village where I had, which, which was a place that I was very inspired by the various things that led me to where I'm today. So that's what happened. And, um, and we talked about the Foundations of Systems course, which I've shared with you. By the way, one of the things that I want to emphasize is, um, you know, this course I used to teach at MIT, but I've made it accessible to anyone. You don't have to go to MIT. You don't have to... Uh, be an MIT student, you don't have to know math, uh, but we've given a $2,500 scholarship to all, um, all adults anywhere in the world to take. So there's no reason anyone should not be able to take it. It's a course that you can take on your own time and you can go to vashiva.com slash join. I also told everyone in India that they get the book for free, but I wanted to read you sort of why this, you know, there's, if you get the System and Revolution book, it's absolutely free. You just have to cover shipping and handling now. Um, but um, there's a first chapter in this book called Why Read This Book, and I'll, I'll read it to you. It says, we have bread, but no health. We have land, but no freedom. We have, quote unquote, peace, but no truth. For truth, freedom, health, we need revolution. And to make revolution, you need a practical understanding of the principle of all systems. This book will teach you those principles in a practical way by using your body as a system. We've created a very powerful tool called Your Body, Your System. So we apply these systems principles to your body. Health and well-being will be a result, but more importantly, 
what you will really learn are the unifying principles of all systems, which will provide you the knowledge to make revolution on any system here and now. So imagine kids getting access to, I mean, a, the book is about 108, 116 pages, but they don't have to wait to go to if they get accepted to MIT or not, or if they want to do engineering. So I believe that the knowledge in this course should be made accessible to every child. So it's absolutely free. And for you adults out there, I highly encourage you to take the course and then you can be a philanthropist and you can give this course to as many, many kids as you want. People get access to a very another powerful book called Your Body, Your System. So the goal is not about, you know, accumulating wealth and building some um, money making uh, institution here, but it's really to inspire adults to take the course and then to you to be agents of change where you don't have to be a billionaire. You can be a philanthropist and you can offer this course to as many kids as you want. So please go do that. So, by the way, these are this is the fields that I grew up in. My grandparents owned a couple of acres of land when they were poor subsistence farmers. And you can see they don't own it anymore, but this is sort of the rice fields. You can see how beautiful they are. And you can see there's these beautiful storks that land there. But these are these wonderful fields that are there. Now, here's another picture of those storks. And this, uh, I mean, you can, you don't have to even be a great photographer. You can just point and click. And this is a hay fields where my great grandfather used to, you know, bale the hay. Uh, Michelle and I, we decided to go to his monument where they had cremated him. And this is the road over there. Uh, and that's where he used to work. And even when he was, you know, 90 years old, this is his memorial. And this says 1870 to 1972. He lived up to 102. This was an honoring we did for him. Uh, we prayed to God. And then we typically in India, you give coconuts. We honored his uh, area. And so this was to my great grandfather, not to my grandfather. So we're talking about my great grandfather, who I knew very, very well. Some of you may know the story, but my great grandfather was extremely hardworking. He uh, was an indentured servant, which was a slave. He went from India to Burma to work. And after World War II, he came back to India. He was very frugal, but if anyone needed any money for education, he would take whatever money he had and we'd give it away to people. So he was very revered like almost like a god in India, but um, you can see, uh, and by the way, the ashes um, that he wanted put in, and there's a little stream here, and this stream literally leads to the Indian Ocean right from here. So he knew where this would go to. By the way, in India, I want to make a commentary. You know, you have street dogs everywhere, okay? And, you know, in America, we own our dogs. We have pets, Across India, these animals are actually allowed to sort of coexist with humans. They run sort of wild, but human beings actually take care of the dogs. Uh, people make them clothes. They'll feed them. Um, so the dogs have this very interesting symbiotic relationship um, with human beings. And these are some of the scenes. You know, I want to play this scene. The next morning after this, we went out, just walk around the village because I wanted to show Michelle. And these are some of the scenes at sunrise you can see here. And now as I was walking, what you'll see here is there's a plant that I remember as a child that my grandmother, if people had any sinus issues, she'd have me go out and pick. And I saw the same flower. Now this flower, when you take the flower, you put the tip of the flower in your nose and she would tap it and people would get released, relieved of any sinus issues. The leaf of this flower, if you pick it, it will actually release like a white pus and if you put it on any type of wound, um, it's an antibiotic. And that's the leaf of this, okay? So this was sort of the medical piece of it. After this, we went to go look at some palm fruit. We're not talking about date palms, but palm fruit. And these palm fruit grow on palm trees. And as I've shared with some of you before, the cast that I came from, our lot in life was to pick those palm fruit that was our cast. That was sort of the low cast job. The palm tree, by the way, is an amazing tree for all the bourgeois liberals in the West who try to say they're into sustainability. They have no idea that these people that I'm going to share with you, and here's a picture of this guy that I'll share with you tomorrow. And here's a guy, he's 60 years old and he climbs the palm. I mean, he's just ripped. You don't even have to go work out. But this guy climbs 
uh, 300 trees every day and he brings back the palm juice, which I'll talk about tomorrow. And you can see he's 60 years old. And what this guy was telling me, I'll talk more about this, was that his father is 90 years old and he still climbs the palm trees. And he said his grandfather died at 118 up until 100 he climbed. <laughs>